Welcome to 2023 and the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the first quarter. Lesson 11 is titled Managing in Tough Times and is read in preparation for teaching on March 18. Sabbath afternoon, March 11. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, our memory verse this week tells us to offer thanksgiving to you and to pay our vows as the one who is the Most High and to be able to call upon you in trouble. And Lord, we're reading this week a a lesson that deals with managing in tough times and many of us have experienced tough times over the past three years. We just want to thank you that we've been able to put our trust in you And we thank you that your word expresses to us your love and your grace. And we've seen it in our lives and in the lives of those around us, Lord. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us wherever we're living in this world, whether it be on any of the great continents or whether it be on an island in the middle of the ocean. Lord, we just thank you that your word is not just precious to us, but it is salvation for us as well. And today I'd like to pray particularly for those listening in Ride in Sydney or Chernside Park in Victoria and Mary Ann Kearns in Dungog in New South Wales and Tenji in Malawi and Cheryl Stay in Kingstown and Marsha in Bermuda and Carmen and Nora and then T. Ben in Israel and Kwafani Chakawamba uh, uh, in Africa. And Lord, we just thank you that we can pray to you at any time. And Leon in Belize loves to pray, Lord, and we pray that you'll be with Leon and bless him and his family and his local community, that your spirit may be shown through his life, that others may want to know more about you. Bless us now as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Let's read that again, Psalm 50, verses 14 and 15. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Sometimes our world seems to be spinning out of control. Wars, bloodshed, crime, immorality, natural disasters, pandemics, economic uncertainty, political corruption, and more. There is a strong urge for individuals and families to think first of their own survival. Accordingly, much thought is given to seeking security in these uncertain times, which of course is understandable. The toils of life do take a lot of our daily focus. With debts to pay, children to raise, property to maintain, it does take time and thought. And of course, we do need clothes, food and shelter. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus addressed these very basic needs and then stated, Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew 6, verses 32 and 33. Amid trying times, when we need to lean on the Lord more than ever, there are some concrete steps based on biblical principles that we should follow. Sunday, March 12, Putting God First Read 2 Chronicles 20, verses 1 to 22. What important spiritual principles can we take from this story for ourselves, whatever struggles we are facing? 2 Chronicles 20, beginning at verse 1. It happened after this that the people of Moab, with the people of Ammon and others, with them besides the Ammonites, came to battle against Jehoshaphat. Then some came and told Jehoshaphat, saying, A great multitude is coming against you from beyond the sea, from Syria, and they are in Hazazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared, and set himself to seek the Lord, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. 
So Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord, and from all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. Then Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven, and do you not rule over all the kingdoms of the nations, and in your hand is there not power and might, so that no one is able to withstand you? Are you not our God, who drove out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel, and gave it to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, forever? And they dwell in it, and have built you a sanctuary in it for your name, saying, If disaster comes upon us, sword, judgment, pestilence, or famine, we will stand before this temple and in your presence, for your name is in this temple, and cry out to you in our affliction, and you will hear and save. And now... Here are the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whom you would not let Israel invade when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and did not destroy them. Here they are, rewarding us by coming to throw us out of your possession, which you have given us to inherit. O oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do but our eyes are upon you. Now all Judah, with their little ones, their wives and their children, stood before the Lord. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jeol, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly, and he said, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Tomorrow go down against them. They will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. You will not need to fight in this battle. Position yourselves. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshipping the Lord. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korahites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with voices loud and high. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa, and as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed those who should sing to the Lord, and who should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army, and were saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endures for Ever. Now, when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. Toward the close of Jehoshaphat's reign, Judah was invaded. Jehoshaphat was a man of courage and valour. For years he had been strengthening his armies and his fortified cities. He was well prepared to meet almost any enemy, yet in this crisis he did not put his confidence in his own strength, but in the power of God. He set himself to seek the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. The people all gathered together in the court of the temple, as Solomon had prayed that they would do if faced by danger. All the men of Judah stood before the Lord with their wives and children. They prayed that God would confuse their enemies and that his name might be glorified. Then the king prayed, We have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. That's Second Chronicles 20 verse 12. After they committed themselves to God in this manner, the Spirit of the Lord came upon a man of God who said, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You will not need to fight in this battle. 
position yourselves, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And that's verses 15 to 17. So, early the next morning, the king assembled the people with the Levitical choir in the front to sing the praises of God. Then he admonished the people, Believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. Verse 20. Then the choir began to sing, and their enemies destroyed one another, and none escaped. We read that in verse 24, which reads, So when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were their dead bodies, fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. It took the men of Judah three days just to collect the spoils of the battle, and on the fourth day they returned to Jerusalem, singing as they went. Of course, the God who delivered them is the same God whom we love and worship, and His power is just as great today as back then. The challenge for us is to trust in Him and His leading. And so to finish the day, read Second Chronicles 20 verse 20. What special significance should this text have for Seventh-day Adventists? Second Chronicles 20, verse 20. So they rose early in the morning and went out into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, and you shall prosper. Monday, March 13. Trust God, not your own resources. King David should have known better. He should have known from the experience of his best friend Jonathan that when you are in a covenant relationship with God, it doesn't matter whether you have a few men or many. God can give you the victory. In 1 Samuel 14, 1-23, the Bible records the story of how Saul's son Jonathan and Jonathan's armour-bearer defeated an entire garrison of Philistines, with the help of God. But in spite of this experience and many others in the history of God's people, when difficult times came to King David, he allowed Satan to tempt him to trust in his own strength and ingenuity. Let's read that story in 1 Samuel 14, verses 1 to 23. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armour, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting in the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Echabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod, but the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other Senna. The front of one faced northward, opposite Michmash, and the other southward, opposite Gibeah. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armour, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So his armour-bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, Very well, let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, Come up to us, then we will go. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Then the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armour-bearer and said, Come up to us, and we will show you something. 
Jonathan said to his armor-bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor-bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. As he had come after him, his armor-bearer killed them. That first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor-bearer made was about twenty men within half an acre of land. And there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked, so that it was a very great trembling. Now the watchman of Saul in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away, and they went here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Now call the roll and see who has gone from us. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor-bearer were not there. And Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here. For at that time the ark of God was with the children of Israel. Now it happened, while Saul talked to the priest, that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled, and they went to the battle. And indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbour, and there was very great confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews, who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding country, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth-Avon. Read First Chronicles chapter 21, verses 1 to 14. Why did David decide to number Israel or count his soldiers? Why did his commander Joab counsel against this? First Chronicles chapter 21 Beginning at verse 1, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the leaders of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And Joab answered, May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my lord the king, are they not all my lord's servants? Why then does my lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Therefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Then Joab gave the sum of the number of the people to David. All Israel had one million one hundred thousand men who draw the sword, and Judah had four hundred and seventy thousand men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them, for the king's word was abominable to Joab. And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he struck Israel. So David said to God, I have sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now, I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David, saying, Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, Thus says the Lord God, Choose for yourself either three years of famine, or three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you, or else for three days the sword of the Lord, the plague in the land, with the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. And David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel, and seventy thousand men of Israel fell. Note that it was Satan's idea to count the soldiers. He tempted David to trust in his own strength, rather than to depend on the providence of God in his defence. 
Joab, the leader of Israel's army, tried to persuade David not to number Israel because he had seen God work on behalf of Israel, but David demanded that the numbering go forward. His actions brought calamity to the nation, as the text reveals. No one ever trusted God in vain. Whenever you do battle for the Lord, prepare yourself and prepare well too. There's a quote attributed to a British ruler, Oliver Cromwell, who lived from 1599 to 1658, who, before a battle, said to his army, Put your trust in God, my boys, and keep your powder dry. The powder was gunpowder. In other words, do all that you can to succeed, but in the end, realise that only God can give you the victory. In our immediate context, it is very tempting to trust in the power of the government or in our bank accounts. But in every crisis mentioned in the Bible, when the people trusted in God, he honoured their trust and provided for them. We should be using the present time to get square with God, get out of debt and be generous with what we have been given. In the words of the well-known Thomas Dorsey gospel song, if we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. And so to finish today, how do we strike the right balance between doing what we can, for instance, to be financially secure, and yet at the same time trusting in the Lord for all things? Tuesday, March 14. Time to simplify? What should Seventh-day Adventist Christians do in response to difficult times? Do we hunker down in a survival mode? No, in fact, just the opposite is true. Because we know that the end of the world and the second coming of Christ is near, we want to use our assets to tell others the good news of the gospel and what God has prepared for those who love him. We understand that someday soon, everything in this earth will be burned up. Read Second Peter chapter 3, verses 3 to 12. What is Peter telling us with these words? Second Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 3, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they will willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire unto the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? We understand from the word of God that he is not sending moving vans to take our stuff to heaven. It will all get burnt up in the final conflagration, when all traces of sin and evil will be forever destroyed. So, what should we do with our possessions? We read in Councils on Stewardship, page 59, It is now that our brethren should be cutting down their possessions instead of increasing them. We are about to move to a better country, even a heavenly. Then, let us not be dwellers upon the earth, but be getting things into as compact a compass as possible. End of quote. Of course, she wrote those words more than a century ago. 
but still the principle remains. Time is always short because our lives are always short. What are 60, 80 or 100 years, if you have good genes and good health practices, in contrast to eternity? Your life can end before you finish reading this week's lesson, and the next thing you will know is the second coming of Jesus. Wow, that was fast after all, wasn't it? As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we must always live in the light of eternity. Yes, of course, we need to work hard to provide for ourselves and our families. And, if we have been blessed with wealth, nothing is wrong with enjoying it now, provided we don't become greedy and are generous with it in regard to the needy. Yet, we must always remember that whatever we accumulate here is transitory, fleeting, and, if we are not careful, has the potential to be spiritually corrupting. And so, to finish the day, if you knew Jesus were coming within ten years, how would you change your life? Or within five years? Or three? Wednesday, March 15. Priorities. The parables and teachings of Jesus, the stories of Bible characters, and the counsel of Ellen G. White all indicate clearly that there is no halfway commitment to Christ. Either we are, or we are not on the Lord's side. When asked by a scribe which commandment was the greatest, Jesus answered in Mark 12.30, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. When we give all to Christ, there is nothing left for another master. That is the way it is. That is the way it must be. Read Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. What has been your own experience with the truth of these words? Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Notice Jesus didn't say that it was hard to serve God and money or that you needed to be careful in how you served both. He said instead that it couldn't be done, period. This thought should put a bit of fear and trembling in our souls, as we read in Philippians 2 verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Read 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. How are these three things manifested in our world, and why is the danger they present sometimes more subtle than we realise? 1 John 2, beginning at verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. No wonder Paul wrote, Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth, in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. Of course, that's easier said than done, because the things of the world are right here before us every day. The lure of all that is in the world is strong. The pull for immediate gratification is always there, whispering in our ears, or pulling on our shirt sleeves, or both. Hasn't even the most faithful Christian felt some love for the things of the world? Even with our knowledge that one day it will all end, we still feel the pull don't we? The good news, however, is that we don't need to let it pull us away from the Lord. And so to finish today, read Second Peter chapter 3 verses 10 to 14. How should what Paul says here impact how we live, including what we do with our resources? Second Peter 3 beginning at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. 
and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless. Thursday, March 16, when no one can buy or sell. The Bible paints a painful picture of the world before the second coming of Jesus. Daniel writes about a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time in Daniel 12 verse 1. Considering some of the troublous times in the past, what he is referring to here must be pretty bad. The book of Revelation also points to troubling times before the return of Christ. Read Revelation 13, verses 11 to 17. How do financial matters fit in with the end-time persecution? Revelation 13, beginning at verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. You can't buy or sell? How much of our lives today revolves around buying and selling? Our work is, in a sense, our selling of our time and skills and goods to those who want to buy them. Not being able to buy or sell all but means not being able to function in society. The pressure on those who remain faithful will then be enormous. Plus, the more money that you have, the more stake you will have in this world, at least in terms of material possessions, and so, surely, the pressure to conform will be even stronger. How then do we prepare? We prepare now by making sure, through God's grace, that we are not slaves to our money, to the things of the world. If we are not bound to them now, we won't be when we will, in order to be faithful, have to give them up. Read Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 22, and the last part of verse 23. What were God's people to do with their increase or production each year? Why did God ask them to do this? Deuteronomy 14, beginning at verse 22. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year, and you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. God explained through Moses that one of the reasons he established the tithing system was, in Deuteronomy 14.23, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. In the poetic parallelism of Psalm 31.19, we see that fear is synonymous with trust. 
Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you. These parallel lines show us that to fear the Lord is to trust him. Therefore, we understand that God established the tithing system to protect us from selfishness and to encourage us to trust him to provide for us. While being faithful in tithe is certainly not a guarantee that people will stay faithful in the end, those who are not faithful in tithe are surely setting themselves up for trouble. Friday, March 17. Though nothing in the Bible warns against wealth, nothing in the Bible talks about wealth as increasing one's spiritual commitment either. In fact, the opposite danger is true. The love of money, Ellen White writes in Steps to Christ, page 44, the desire for wealth is the golden chain that binds them, that's people, to Satan. End of quote. In fact, since the foundation of Christianity, no church has ever partaken of such wealth and creature comforts as the church in many countries of the world enjoys today. The question is, at what cost? Such affluence surely influences our spirituality, and not for the good either. How could it? Since when have wealth and material abundance fostered the Christian virtues of self-denial and self-sacrifice? Can coming home to refrigerators stuffed with more food than we can eat, and owning one or two cars, and taking yearly vacations, and shopping online, and having the latest in home computers and smartphones, make it easier to love not the world nor the things of the world? Though many members of our church don't have these luxuries, many do and they do so at the peril of their own souls. We are not talking about the rich now, as in millionaires and beyond. They at least know that they are rich, and they can heed, if they choose, the biblical cautions given them. We are talking instead about many, even of the middle class people, who, amid smartphones, iMacs, air conditioning and SUVs, are fooled enough to think that, because they are just middle class, they are not in danger of being spiritually pickled by their own prosperity. That's why tithing can be, if nothing else, a powerful spiritual antidote to the dangers of wealth, even for those who are not particularly wealthy. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Even if we are not rich by the world standards, why must we all be careful about our attitude toward money and wealth? 2. What are some practical things we can do, besides tithing, that can help us make sure we are not getting too caught up in the things of this world? 3. What would happen to you tomorrow if suddenly you could not buy or sell because you were numbered among those who, as it says in Revelation 14.12, who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus? How well would your faith fare? And now it's time for our mission story for this week, read by my niece Sibylla, who, like me, is also a volunteer. Thank you, Sibylla. Two best friends, Bachifandu Kanjo. Bahadu Ibrahim was born to non-Christian parents who expected him to follow their faith in central Malawi. He had no problem with that because he did not know any other religion. But then an older brother married a Seventh-day Adventist woman and joined the Adventist church. As a teen, Bahadu was sent by his parents to live with his brother and his wife in Malawi's capital, Lilingu. When Sabbath came, his brother expected him to go to church with them. Bahadu did not want to go, but he felt like he had no choice. For two years, he went to church every Sabbath out of a sense of duty. Returning to his parents in Kalaluma village, he thought to forget the Bible. But he made friends with another teenager who happened to be an Adventist. Bahadu admired his new friend very much for his kindness and gentleness. Everyone in the village admired the young man and spoke highly of him. One Sabbath, the friend invited Bahadu to go to church. What could Bahadu do? He went. He was glad to spend time with his best friend, even in church. 
As time passed, their friendship grew, and Bahadu listened to his friend explain that the Seventh-day Adventist was the true Sabbath of God. His friend gave him books to read. Little by little, he understood new truths about God and the Sabbath. However, he was not convinced that Saturday was the true Sabbath. Without his parents' knowledge, he decided to compare the Bible with his family's traditional religious books. As he read, he discovered that his family's religious books contained only one woman's name, Mariam, the mother of Jesus. He also discovered that Jesus is Lord. Bahadu decided to give his heart to Jesus in baptism. He no longer went to church out of sense of duty. He went to spend special time with his new best friend. After Bahadu's baptism, his parents disowned him and stopped paying his high school fees, leaving him unable to graduate with the rest of his class. Both of his parents died without accepting his decision, and many relatives continue to treat him with hostility today. But Bahadu has not wavered in his faith. This is the best decision that I have ever made, he said. Today he is a student at Malawi Adventist University studying to become a pastor. Thank you for your 2021 13 Sabbath offering that is helping to construct a community outreach and leadership development centre on the Mizuzu campus of Malawi Adventist University, where Bihadu studies in the Southern African Indian Ocean Division. This quarter's offering will support six additional educational projects in the neighbouring East Central Africa Division. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. And you can listen and watch at the same time on YouTube. Remember, God is always faithful. And here is a disclaimer. Contents of these lessons are not intended to be financial advice, but is general commentary based on biblical principles. The reader is encouraged to seek competent professional advice which will suit their particular personal situation.